hats off to Donald Trump, the president designate of the United States of America. Welcome, Swagadam to everyone. America congratulates itself on choosing Donald Trump as the 47th president of the United States of America. At the same time, the various appointments that he is now making, for example, Matt Gates as the next attorney general of the country, an extremely important position, or Tulsi Gabbard as a director of national intelligence, again, a critical, crucial appointment, or Pete Hexeth as Secretary Defense, or Robert Kennedy as Secretary Health, or even more important than all of this, Elon Musk as uh, the chief of the committee tasked with uh, making the American administration more cost effective. Uh, in tandem with uh, Ramaswamy, who was one of the presidential candidates who abandoned the race in favor of Trump and therefore he had to be rewarded and he will be rewarded. Trump is a grateful man. In fact, all these appointments are inspired by one very noble, commendable emotion and that's gratitude. No one can argue that gratitude is a bad thing. All these are loyalists and therefore Trump is grateful to them and his gratitude, unlike the gratitude of most of us, is not limited to words alone. He takes his gratitude to action and therefore all the appointments that he would make, as is to be expected, will be of this kind. Now, I am not at all surprised or amused that Trump has chosen these individuals and many like like them. I've only uh, named a few just to give us ourselves a flavor of the kind of appointments in the offing. <clears throat> I'm quite sure the Ameri that the Americans who voted Trump overwhelmingly to be their next supreme leader knew quite well what Trump really was like, is like, and will be like forever. Uh, the tiger does, cannot change its spots, as the book of Proverbs says. He is not an unknown quantity. One good thing about Trump is that no one can accuse him of hypocrisy. You can accuse him of anything. But the one thing that you cannot accuse Donald Trump is the priestly virtue of hypocrisy. All of us know that when Jesus looked at the priestly class of his times, he saw nothing but hypocrisy in them. But the one thing I don't see and the one thing none of us can see in Donald Trump is any vestige of hypocrisy. He's a raw man out there. He doesn't, he doesn't have any pretensions. He doesn't say that I'm, you know, idealistic, and, you know, I go by principles and uh, I have this moral compulsion. Nothing of the sort. This is what I want. My will will prevail. That's enough, period. That's Trump. And interestingly, this is precisely what makes Donald Trump popular in the United States. Nobody voted for Trump thinking that he is a humble person, he is meek and gentle, or that he will go entirely by merit in making all important appointments or that he'll be a particularly low-abiding citizen, a myth that could not survive after the Capitol Hill drama four years ago, 6th of January, 2020. All these things are fresh in our mind, or in the minds of Americans who voted for them. And every American who voted for Trump knew that the sole single reason for his 
enviable success, material success, is his murderous selfishness. Trump is only for himself. And everything else will come after that. He'll take the name of Jesus Christ. He'll pledge allegiance to the Bible. He'll argue the case for bringing religion back into America. But everything will be second to the agenda of securing the supreme preeminence of Trump and ensuring that the whole country will fall in line with his individual will. Whether or not that will conduce to and translates itself into uh, the long-term well-being of Americans or greatness for the American country, <coughs> America as a nation. Now, therefore, the people of America, thinkers are ordinary people. They have no excuse for now rubbing their hands in uh, resentment or grievance or surprise. Donald Trump has not taken you for a ride. You got onto the wagon, bandwagon, knowing fully well what the wagon was like. Therefore, you have absolutely no right to look surprised or aggrieved. If you do, you will cut a sorry figure, that's all. In this context, if Americans would heed, let me cite a few words from the great Chinese thinker who lived some 3,000 years ago, 2,600 years ago, his name is Confucius. Don't confuse that name with the English word Confucian. He is one without the slightest trace of confusion. If there was one clear thinker in China, it was Confucius. And none of us can come anywhere near him in clarity of thought. And the, the sanctified sense of realism he has. Home truths expressed in the beauty of the domestic language that we use. Tremendous sanctified practical sense. So Confucius said, Do not appoint a man you cannot trust. Also, do not distrust the man you choose. I repeat, you can't have a statement simpler than this, right? But it harbors, it holds a profound practical truth. Do not appoint a man you cannot trust. Also, do not distrust the man you have appointed. If, if you, have, you have chosen Donald Trump, he could not have gate crashed into the White House or Oval Office. Americans, in full possession of their senses, exercising their freedom of choice, not coerced by America or Iran, which is most, most Americans pronounce as Iran, even the top level government officers, you can hear them pronouncing Iran as Iran. Everybody uh, knew what Trump was like and therefore it's utterly foolish, utterly foolish to distrust him in anything. You have to give him a free hand to do what he wants, whether you give it to him or not, he will claim it, he will exercise it. All you have to do is to sit and grin and bear it for the next four years that he will be in office and let's hope that it will do some good. Then here I have to express a view which may not be, uh, you know, uh, part of the beaten track. I believe that the people he has chosen for very key position so far, some of which I have mentioned, I won't repeat. <clears throat> they are not the run-of-the-mill stuff. Many of them are raw. They have no experience in this field. Many of them are alleged to have not the professional and the academic qualifications required for the offices for which they are now designated. Some of them, it appears, have made statements 
taken stands in the past which render them furiously unfit for the job intended for them. And Tulsi Gabbard is of that kind reportedly. But I don't think that p- picking people who are not hardwired in the governmental line is such a bad thing. Rather, I would say it's a good thing. Because those who are nurtured within the system, the jaded items within the establishment, who have been the parasites of the status quo, who can think only in terms of stereotypes, who cannot think out of the box, who cannot swerve from the beaten track, they'll only repeat the old stuff. That's why in India you see repeatedly the cabinet changes, parties of governance change, but basically the governmental culture, the culture of governance remains the same. It is still the old imperial, colonial culture of governance. That will not change. That is because the people who actually deliver governance are not politicians. They are part of what's called the civil service. The word civil is not particularly appropriate here, but it's called the civil service because the word civil, unlike civic, has also the meaning polite. That's why I'm saying this. They are trained in the same manner. They are placed in the same uh, mold. They belong to the same administrative tradition and culture. And therefore, they can think only in the stereotypical mold in which they have been trained. Therefore, it's foolish and unrealistic to expect radical changes to be sponsored by them. In fact, the bureaucracy is not meant, designed or trained to be champions and pioneers of radical initiatives. In fact, their genius is all towards nipping radical initiatives in the the bud. And I say this because of my experience of discussing various ideas with very top-level bureaucrats of this country in the past. I'm not talking in the air. I don't expect radical ideas to emerge from... In fact, there have been some among among them who could think somewhat radically. For example... Aruna Roy was a member of the civil service. Within 10 years, she decided to quit. Why did she do so? Because she found that she could not give effect to her line of thinking, pro-people thinking, within the steel frame of the civil service. Harsh Mandar, a fellow Stephanian whom I know quite well, He was a very distinguished member of the civil service. Why did he resign? And why did he resort to social action? So people who have any radical instincts, people who want to think out of the box, people who want to attempt initiatives that are different from the set stereotypical patterns that are deeply entrenched in this field, they won't be found within the system. Anyone who is hardwired within the system will be, for that very reason, crippled in terms of bringing a shaft of fresh air into the culture of governance. Therefore, if Trump has chosen these people, irrespective of whatever demerits other people are inclined to read into them, I would rather wait for them to prove themselves in the first couple of years in office. You've chosen Trump. Trump will have his way. His way is that he can be comfortable only with blind supporters and psychophants. He's not someone who will brook the slightest disagreement, dissent of any kind. Everybody knew this. And therefore, what else except filling all these important posts with uh, yes, yes, 
and uh, people are willing to kowtow to the uh, unfettered authority of uh, the president will be accepted and chosen by him. That's stupid. So, I rather commend to the Americans the wisdom of Confucius. Do not choose a man you cannot trust, but do not distrust the man you have chosen. Then we also conclude with a little bit of Indian wisdom. Now, I am particularly fascinated by Lord Krishna, Sri Krishna. People refer to his 16,000 concubines with some degree of Christians, not Hindus. Christians refer to the 16,000 concubines of Lord Krishna, Sri Krishna, with some degree of spiritual, uh, shall I say, squeamishness. I'm afraid that's because they've not understood the meaning of this. I'm not an expert on Hinduism. In fact, I'm embarrassed about my illiteracy in this regard. But let me share with you what I think about this. Krishna has two options. One is to belong to the palace, the palace of Kansa, the cruel man, the iron-willed ruler of the country, the strong state, the hard state, the macho leader, 56 inches, chest, so on and so forth. Kansa is of that mold. What's the outcome? The outcome is the children could be killed if they are seen as either threats or an, uh, inconveniences. That's a culture of governance. That's a palace culture. Would you like Lord Krishna to belong to the palace culture or to, to this kind of culture where he's sporting with Leela, he's sporting with his concubines and trying to be human? I would rather have a human and humane and if you don't mind, romantic Lord Krishna who has time for the Gopikas than a Krishna who lodges himself within the inhuman iron frame of the palace governance structure and sees fellow human beings as either security threats or dangers who have to be strictly controlled using the iron fist. Do you think such a Lord Krishna would have been in a position to advise Arjuna in the manner that is depicted in the Gita, which is so very popular with the Hindus, understandably so. So, there are two possibilities. Either you are a Kansa, then Gopikas will be left alone. There is no romance. All the 16,000 can marry. The... Uh, young men of their dreams. Or you can be a Lord Krishna who renounces all that and prefers rather to be with women than with those heartless, cruel specimens of humanity uh, that, that throng in palaces. So there is in this an implicit or implied crit criticism or denunciation of the kind of culture that prevails in centers of power. I consider that to be very healthy. So, it's only when a person like Lord Krishna adopts a path which is completely contrary to what would have been expected of him as belonging to the royal lineage that you have a Gita. I'm not saying that through these various uh, dubious and questionable, seemingly dubious and questionable appointments that are hero Donald Trump is making. Some kind of uh, American version of the Gita will emerge. That don't don't uh, get my idea wrong. I'm, I'm only saying that I don't have great expectations from people who are hardwired in the status quo. Uh, people who think alike, act, act alike. And who are utterly crippled in relation to attempting new beginnings, newer possibilities. And in this context, I want to express particularly my appreciation and approval of giving 
Donald Trump's giving to Elon Musk the opportunity and uh, the extensive control. In fact, the most powerful, the most influential person in this menagerie will be Elon Musk, who ironically is not born in America, he's a South African. And uh, he, um, he belonged to a broken family. His uh, father was uh, uh, nothing much to write home about. His mother played, of course, a big role in his life, and she was the dri driving, motivating, inspiring force behind him, and God bless her. Now, Elon Musk is an entrepreneur, a very successful entrepreneur, and undoubtedly the most successful entrepreneur on planet Earth. The distinctive feature of, of an entrepreneur is that he can think out of the box. He can see possibilities that others cannot. And he also knows how to go about translating dreams into realities. Above all, he knows the meaning of cost effectiveness, the, the SWOT analysis. He knows how much can be got out of a dollar. He understands the meaning of efficiency. And I would, will not bat an eyelid if our president Narendra Modi ji, imitating Trump's example, after all, Indians are very competent imitators. So imitating the role model of his boosom friend, Donald Trump, tomorrow appoints Adani as the, uh, to a post equivalent to that of what Elon Musk is going to exercise. Uh, the committee to ensure governmental efficiency headed by Adani and uh, seconded by, supported by Ambani. But whether or not they will have the kind of uh, patriotic vision uh, and commitment that, that Elon Musk has and the capacity to deliver at the governmental levels is something that I'm not particularly sure about. So, frankly speaking, I'm not looking forward to such a possibility. But I certainly believe that of all the things that Donald Trump has done so far, the most hope-giving, most sensible step he has taken is creating this Department of Governmental Efficiency and appointing Elon Musk and Ramaswamy as the chief animators of this unprecedented department. And in fact, globally, there must be a concern for improving governmental efficiency. In India, the government is a massive consumer of national resources. And in fact, there is an urgent case for downsizing the governmental gargantuan governmental monster cut it down to size and it can be done without undermining uh, efficiency one bit rather efficiency would only improve in fact one of the reasons why government departments and offices are so frightfully inefficient is that they are overstaffed overstaffed you go to a government office and don't be surprised if there are 10 people in a particular room at least three, four of them would be sleeping in their seats. That's because they're supernumerary. All these departments are overstaffed. So there is a tremendous scope for downsizing administration. And particularly after privatization, globalization, etc. has become the order of the day, there is no excuse whatsoever for the governmental uh, structure being retained as per the old scale and pattern. So this one thing is worthy of emulation and I hope it happens. And uh, I also hope that a certain degree of decentralization of administration will happen. It's something that talked about, that's been talked about for a long time, but the more decentralization is lauded and recognized to be the urgent priority of the day, the more 
heavy centralization of administration is resorted to. It's a riddle that I have not been able to unravel. Maybe some of you can, uh, some of you can enlighten me and uh, the rest of us on this if you care. Anyway, so my point is, unlike uh, the Americans who now seem nettled, stung, that Trump is making these characteristic appointments. I hail these appointments. I salute him. I appreciate him for acting entirely in character. This is the typical Trump undiluted, unbornished, unadulterated. And Trump is in full authentic flow. And it's something beautiful to watch. And I wish Americans all the best. God save America. Thank you.